Hi, it's Lucy, and today I'm here to start my reading vlog for Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. If you weren't watching my channel last year, you would not know that this is one of my favorite books of 2018, and one of my favorite books, like, ever. And so in honor of Children of Virtue and Vengeance, the sequel to this book, and the second book in what will be a trilogy, I am rereading this and documenting it in the form of a reading vlog to celebrate that and also hopefully give people who want to read it a refresher who don't feel like going through the trouble of rereading an entire, how many pages is this? 500? Yeah, an entire over 500 page book. So that's what I'm here for. Sorry about the lighting. I know we hate YouTubers who apologize for the lighting, but it's really bad. Like if I lean forward, it looks like that. So I have to be this far back the whole time, which is why I'm using my mic for a vlog. Um, sorry if we're interrupted by my cat. I swear I'm not trying to become a cat channel. I am obsessed with my cat, but I'm not, it's, but I'm not trying to impose that on you. It's just, he just wants to be around me a lot, which I don't want to discourage because I love him. Anyway, not the point. So this is just strictly a reading vlog. This video will be spoilery. If you have not read Children of Blood and Bone and you want to read it, I recommend not watching this video because I will spoil everything. I will mention things that happen at the end that while I'm still reading the beginning and things like that. And if you don't plan to read it, then I would ask you to plan to read it because I love this book. Or at least I think I love this book. One of the things, that I was a little worried about, but I was still gonna reread it anyway, is that I wouldn't love it as much the second time around because I wouldn't have the novelty of it being the first time I read it. There were some problems that I did see when I first read it that I basically ignored or they just weren't as big of a deal for me that I feel like now that I'm rereading it, like there'll be more glaring problems to me, so we'll see. For now, I'm actually 140 pages into the book right now. I started this book last week and You'll see my last reading vlog, I ended up putting, I mean, you won't see because I don't mention it, but I ended up putting it down for the books in my last reading vlog, which was I Become Books and Lala. So if you're interested in that, that's also linked down below. I have been not exactly taking notes, but I use the front flap of the hardcover as a dust jacket, as a bookmark, in case you're wondering. I have been like doing like little post-it things or whatever. I tab my books, but I don't have any rhyme or reason for tabbing them. Like I don't have a whole like color coding system or anything. Uh, the tabs that I'm using right now are like circus themed ones that came in an owl crate like two years ago at this point. These are the only ones I have left. Yeah, so they don't mean anything. I just put a tab in whenever I see something interesting. And specifically for this vlog, I put a tab in whenever there was something that I thought I wanted to mention in the vlog or some things that I just wanted to remember. It's a mix of both. Um, so for the first clip in this vlog, I'm going to go over all the tabs that I've already done. Hopefully going to finish it this weekend because I don't want to bring it on the plane with me. Oh, this is the week before Thanksgiving. I'm currently reading this and hopefully you're seeing this on December 1st, two days before Virtue Vengeance comes out. <laughs> I originally read the book in like three or four days, I think, maybe less than that. But I was also listening to the audiobook and I listened to like this, the last two thirds of the book while I was on an airplane that was like a 12 or 13 hour flight. Where was I going? So for now, I'm gonna just go through the tabs and all the thoughts I've been having as I've been reading it so far. There's just a quote that I really liked from uh, the beginning of the book. This is on page 11, in case you're wondering. I don't know if I'm gonna say page numbers for everything that I wanna talk about, but in the beginning when uh, Zele is still in um, like Mama Agba's shop or the guards come in to like tell Mama Agba about the raised taxes and things and Zeli speaks out of turn. Um, there's like a little quote where the guard tells Zeli to be like you would do well to keep your mouth shut and Zeli gets angry obviously and in her thoughts she's like maybe I should be quiet or maybe he should die and I, I felt that in my soul. This is more I guess discussion related but just I don't know thoughts. I have two like sticky notes re related to I guess colorism or just how the book deals with colorism in a way when we're introduced to Amari. She's at like high tea. Amari mentions how people question whether like her mother cheated on her father because they're like they say like she's far too dark to be the kings and slightly later her mom comments on the other girl who's like Amari's age who's there and she's like oh you have to give Amari your skincare routine because you look so regal now and by regal she means lighter. The whole colorism aspect isn't really focused on in the book, especially since we move away from the royal family in the later parts of the book. But it's just, I don't know, disappointing 
that in this whole world of only black people who would not have been affected by like white colonialism or anything still have like this whole colorism aspect. I just, I don't know. I know this book is about a lot of things and has parallels to the real world in a lot of things, but I just wish this one little aspect like we could escape from for a little bit. I did one when Binta gets killed by the king, which honestly, when I first read that, like originally, that shook me. I did not expect that. I did not expect it. Obviously this time I knew it was gonna happen, but um, it still kind of shook me. And it also just made me think about all of Amari's future scenes where she thinks about Binta. And I'm, I really think it's a missed opportunity not to make that particular relationship gay. Just the way she's like, talks about her, how deep and close their friendship was. Like, yes, you can have deep platonic friendships, but how often do we see female-female romances, especially in like a groundbreaking book as this? That would have been super duper great. And I would have appreciated just the way Binta talk, or not Binta, uh, Amari talks about Binta. Like, it was gay, come on. Chapter five, when Zelly's in La Lagos and she's like, I gotta save Amari, even though she doesn't know Amari yet. That's literally when everything goes to hell. And when I originally read this book, I was like, you stupid, stupid girl, what are you doing? She had just gotten this swordfish, sailfish, whatever it's called, fish, and she sold it for so much money, they weren't gonna have to worry about taxes for years, or at least months, I forget. A long, long time, they were gonna eat good tonight. And then she goes and saves this random girl. And like, yes, it speaks to how good she is that she saw this girl in trouble like in a lot of trouble and her first thought was I must protect her but you could have been eating so good yeah I know they're saving magic and everything but it made me sad uh when Amari reveals that she's actually the princess and Zelly's pissed I would be pissed too especially since Zelly doesn't know that the king is abusive to his family if I was Zelly I would also have been pissed because you risked your life for this girl who you thought probably was like a beggar or something or like a prisoner to the crown or something and then they turn out to be princess. This is page 98. Zelly talks about kind of I guess a little bit of their belief system and specifically the afterlife or she thinks about it I guess. She says that if the trauma of their deaths was too much their spirits won't rise to the afterlife. They'll stay in a potty. I don't know how to say that. An eternal hell reliving the worst of their pain. Um, that sounds one horrifying and also unfair i don't know no afterlife has to be fair but i just thought it was weird and unfair like because you were killed brutally you now must suffer i don't know if this is based on real a real religion or like i'm sure a lot of i mean technically in like christianity most people go to purgatory which is like nothing and boring shouldn't that be i like that if you're a bad person you go to hell if you're a good person you don't do that um or at least if you're a not great person you don't live terribly if you just happen to die badly then you're fucked up for the rest of your eternal days if someone happens to get caught in like a brutal robbery or something well your soul is damned that sounds horrifying i did another sticky note in this we now see like the prince brought zelly to like the dreamland and it turns out he's a dreamwalker i forgot those are called connector he's a connector we once again see zelly not trusting amari and she has every right not to trust her i do not fault her there are a lot of times in this book where i hear zelly or see zelly doing something and i'm like what are you doing why are you so stubborn but this one i feel like she's she's right she saved this girl thinking that she was helpless she ended up being the princess of this kingdom where the king literally killed your mother and a whole generation of people and type of people so yeah i don't i can see why she's mad and amari like defends herself and is like well i brought you this scroll now and my dad killed my best friend and deli like fires back and she's like your best friend or your slave like she really hammers it home that like when you're in a position like that like binto was a diviner this was honestly the best position she could have gotten being her like handmaid and sure you treated her nicely but she didn't have a choice like is that really friendship which i i guess maybe that could have been like if it was gay like if uh binta and amari like were like in love with each other that could be a, a reason against it because it's kind of stockholm syndrome -y. they do make up later in the chapter which i not make up but like start forming more of a friendship and i feel like it could be argued that that was like insta friend but i feel like insta friend versus insta love 
are not the same thing. Like it is a lot easier and people tend to have lower standards for for a friendship versus a like actual lover. Now I'm caught up on where I am in the book. Sorry that the lighting has been so bad. Hopefully you, you that didn't distract you so much. I will continue reading this this weekend. Hello. It is way past Thanksgiving. I laugh at the past me who thought I would have this video up before Children of Virtue and Vengeance came out. Children of Virtue and Vengeance is out. I actually have it. It's still in the package. But this is a reading vlog for Children of Blood and Bone. And yeah, so let's just get into more of my thoughts. I'm not really that much further for the amount of time that has passed between my last clip and this clip. Yeah, I'm on page 214 and I did mark off the last time I like talked to you guys about it. And once again, I'm just gonna go through the post-its that I put down on, on page 151. This is like chapter 16 when Inan is in that store that Amari and Zele were in when Amari sold her like headdress and they kill the merchant. My thought during that was just Kaya. I don't know if Kaya's a badass or just awful because she kills that man and Inan doesn't really know what to do. And she's all, you mustn't tolerate those who get in your way. And I don't know, that was just sad. The next chapter is when they're in the temple with Lakin. Lakin, I listened to the audiobook when I first read this, but, so, but I don't remember how to say everything. So forgive me. Um, when they're in the temple with him and they just meet him and he grabs Zele's hair and is like straight um, with a hint of disappointment. I didn't realize her hair was, I knew her hair was straight, I guess, but I thought it was just like wavy or something based on the cover. And then um, now would be a good time for me to have Children of Virtue and Vengeance out, but Zele is on the cover again and her hair is curly. So does getting, did getting matched back make her hair curly? I don't remember. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. On page 159, there is like the title. If you have ever watched Cinema Sins on YouTube, they do like roll credits every time the title is mentioned within the movie script. And that's kind of what I think of whenever the title is mentioned within the book of something. I, I don't know, I just like having that there. And uh, the line is, on earth, Sky Mother created humans, her children of blood and bone. And I also just loved having that whole story. I thought that was so well thought out, just the whole creation story and learning about all the gods I thought was interesting and cool. And also the fact that the gods are ranked, but not quite because the Magi call like their gods, like their sister deity and not the mother. Like they're on sort of an equal playing field, it feels like within their mythology, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I just realized that what I had just said about the hair being coiled, I guess when they get their magic back is true because I guess I had read that and did not just make that up in my head for some reason because on page 161, as he's still explaining how Magi came about, he says that Magi were graced with coiled white hair, so coiled, but Zelda's hair is straight, so I assume that all the diviner's hair like fell when magic was gone, which I think there probably is a whole discussion. I should be having the discussion. Maybe there, okay, let's just try and have a discussion about hair in this book. I was having like mixed feelings about it because I feel like a lot of the time with black characters, their hair or eye color will be, especially when they're special in some way, like they will end up being with like light blue eyes with dark skin, like having some kind of exoticized feature that is more analogous to being white. And at first I was kind of annoyed that Diviner's hair is white instead of just being black like every other black person. But the more I think about it, the more I kind of actually like it. Not that only white people have like blonde hair or anything, but a black person with blonde hair is much rarer than a white person with blonde hair. But white hair, everyone of all races gets white hair. Okay, so I got really distracted by my cat. What, I, what was I saying? Yes, people of all races have white hair, so it doesn't feel as much of an, an exotifying feature. And also that their hair fell when they lost magic. I don't know how to explain it. I probably should think about this more, but not that it's saying straight hair is bad, but so often coily hair is being seen as bad. So I like how it's actually a symbol of something that's really great. And while Lakin tells the story of how magic got taken away, Zane gets really angry and out of sadness and pain, he gets mad at Lakin because when the Mamalawo people were attacked, Zane wants to know why didn't they fight back. Lakin's response is that my people were tasked with giving life, not taking it away. So it sounds like they like morally couldn't kill anybody or really fight back. And so it was really 
a massacre. And I feel like that sentence really puts out how awful it was what the king did. And now on the chapter that I'm currently am, all three of them, Amari, Zele, and Zane, are in that arena thing. I literally forgot about that arena thing also. I know that was like a very important part of the book. Like that's how they get one the other artifact that they need. Like I just forgot that they did all that. I liked how it showed like the waste of everything. I liked how we got to see a glimpse of the diviners in the stocks, how Zelly goes to help them as little as she can, where they're all shocked about all the water that is being wasted. They're literally in a desert. Where are they even getting it? The diviner, or not the diviners. Yeah, the diviners in the stocks can't afford to be, even be drinking. And then they're on these ships in literal lakes in the middle of the desert. And then also that they're on the ships, they don't have a choice but to literally be in this battle of bloodshed, like they're not coming out. That was just even more depressing. I like this chapter because we get to see in Zele like really hone her reaper skills, but also it is awful. And just to bring it back, I think I mentioned this in the first clip, but just the whole idea of how people die in this universe still really upsets me that if you have too much trauma when you die you just go to hell and live, relive your trauma forever and ever now i'm on chapter 25 i really want to try and like finish this tonight maybe i'll keep you guys updated i'm now on page uh 306 i'm about to like sit down and like try and read a bunch of the book right now or at least for the next half hour or so just try and read straight through and we'll see where I get, but for now I'll just update you guys and tell you my feelings for the post notes I've done so far. Where I last left you guys, it was before the like battle in this desert. I don't really know what to call that. And then we go back to Inan and Inan is trying to figure out like where Zeli and company are and he's like going through the temple and like having like visions from like people who used to be alive there and he ends up seeing something and then Kaya comes in and sees him like dreamwalking and she's like you're one of them and they have that whole duel it's not really a duel he kind of beats her down and then he kills Kaya who is his father's love of his life I guess or like lover woman he loves the only woman he apparently loves only person really it seems because as Kaya's dying he can like see her dreams and thoughts I guess or maybe not as she's dying but like he holds her cor corpse and sees it and he's like the way his father looks at her in that is something he's never seen which I think is really interesting and honestly this book pulls no punches I remember when I first read that I was so shook I was like oh my god he killed someone I I know someone else died or multiple people have already died but not in such a direct way I feel like and that was like so, not someone we knew but someone the characters really knew well or not all the characters but you know knew her really well his dad obviously knows her very well and I feel like the whole like she was his lover thing I don't know how I feel about that because I don't know I know how it ends but yeah it's just a lot so and now we're gonna jump a little faster now we're back at the battle competition thing with Zelly and crew and they're about to join the battle and it's really really scary i feel like the book kind of glosses over. i don't i there's no way to handle this but the book kind of glosses over that to win they also have to kill like a bunch of the other basically slaves in addition to their captains which i don't know just like hurt me a lot i mean it doesn't really gloss it over because zelly feels like all of their souls like leaving their about like them dying and we see that from her but it's just like i don't know i feel like people don't realize like how like gory I guess this is like it's not that gory but I feel like people don't realize like how much this book does like it's like I don't know it just doesn't pull any punches and then at the end of the chapter that I'm on like I was shook once again this book just continues shaking me shaking me shooking me <laughs> like I just keep getting surprised and surprised I mean I'm not surprised because I remember this actually I didn't remember this when I just reread it but some of the other things didn't really surprise me but when they had 30 ships instead of the 10 normal ships and then they still managed to do it like that was insane uh zelly does blood magic so that she can like raise more souls and that was crazy but i feel like that didn't have the, quite the effect that i thought it would because like she does pass out but i don't know she didn't take as long to recover as i thought she would i don't know how long they were in that city there is now a cat in my lap say hi tucker look at the camera okay so back to the book 
And then I'm going to skip forward to when Amari, Zane, and Zelly are waiting while Zelly recovers. Uh, like Zelly is asleep and Zane and Amari are like talking and Zane like tells her that she can leave. And Amari like has a whole like monologue in her head. Is it a monologue? Just thoughts about kind of like being told what to do. And I thought that was really powerful. So now we are further along. This is when Zelly and Amari and Zane are like on their journey. They're close to the village of people basically but this is before that and basically Inan catches up with them and he attacks Zele and they like fight and then Zane and Amari get captured and Zele goes running after them and uh Inan thinks he's gonna kill Zele but then he sees her thoughts I don't exactly understand what he's seeing like dreams memories yeah I guess it's memories um I don't really understand how that works but he sees them and realizes, I guess, that, like, Zelly witnessed her mother die, um, saw, like, the brutal manner in which all of the Magi were killed, and he realized, like, how awful his father is, and I appreciated that realization, but I also want to know, what did he think happened? Like, I know they were young, but all of the Magi did die, like, he kn knew that, so I don't know what he thought happened so that part confused me. I'm about to read for like the next half hour if there's anything that I come across that I want to comment on I'll just open up the vlog and comment on it. Zele and Inan are uh trying to figure out a way to save Zane and Amari and Inan really wants to bring the guards and Zele's like why would I ever trust the guards and she talks about how the guards have treated her awfully and her family awfully and they're the ones they're the people who killed her mother like physically uh, they beat her father they grope her every time she walks by and they're just waiting for her to go to the stocks and this like clicked in my head for me because the author's note at the end last time I read I remember um Tomi Adeyemi talks about how like there are parallels to police brutality and like real world things and I remember not exactly seeing it but I'm just dumb like this is a very clear parallel this is still the police brutality thing i just read the next page and like inan is talking about how he's like they keep lago safe zelly's like they never kept me safe and there's like this really powerful exchange where he says you don't have to be afraid and she says i'm always afraid yeah i just thought it was really powerful and i can't believe i really didn't see it before i don't know what's wrong with me and then inan talks about how he wants to understand and she's like you can't understand they the world is built for you there's so many parallels to real life that I don't know how I missed the first time. Like, I knew. Like, obviously, the Magi versus the Kosidan is, like, a big parallel, but I didn't realize all the intricacies were also parallels. New location. I'm in my sister's house in Florida. They're currently to have like their party like their big gathering i forgot what it's for but yeah they're having it and i just wanted to point out this was a dumb idea <laughs> like i guess because i know what's gonna happen i don't really remember what i must have thought the first time i was reading it but now i'm like why are you wasting all this time at a party go fix magic what are you doing i guess because i know what's gonna happen and i'm like what if they just left right now? They can have the party after they bring the magic back. Why would they do? What, is, what are you doing? Okay, I feel like this is probably relatable to like older siblings, but currently at the part I'm at, Zele and uh, Inan just kissed and Zane and Amari saw them and Zane is pissed. And yeah, I feel like I'm conflicted about it. The speech, monologue, whatever, not conversation he has with Amari, I feel so deeply because like he has every right to be upset. On the other hand, I can see how much that Zele thinks she likes Inan and yeah, I don't know. I'm so I'm conflicted because I feel like because I feel like Zane is right, but also I can see where Zele comes from and I also um he says I keep expecting her to grow up, but why would she when I'm always here? And that's the part that I really feel like it's probably relatable to older siblings who feel like they have to have everything together for their younger siblings. I'm not an older sibling, so I can't really relate to that, but I can, I've definitely seen it in people I know who are older siblings. And yeah, so I thought that was a really powerful paragraph. And now the King's men are here. So now everything's gonna go to shit. Hello, this vlog didn't really go 
the way I expected it to go. But I'm here to end it. I have finally finished Children of Blood and Bone. This video took me like a lot longer to film than I planned. I actually started this in the middle of November, I think. Or like the beginning of November, honestly. I don't re really remember. Because um, my original thought was I was going to finish this video before Thanksgiving. And clearly that didn't happen. Which is fine. I don't really know why it took me so long to finish this book. Other than I just haven't been feeling like reading that much anyway but yeah this is neither here nor there I'm just here to talk about the end of the book and also this is the first time I've done a video like this where I like go into spoilery details about one book so it's just a whole lot of learning curve I think I am planning to do a video for children of virtue and vengeance I am cross your fingers planning to start this today actually where I left off was when we're having the party and then the guards showed up and basically killed everybody, not everybody, but killed several important people in the village that they found, town that they found. What is it? Settlement? Honestly, that was really sad for me. When Kwame and Zu died, that was really sad for me. I felt that. And then Zeli gets tortured, which was on like the definitely the worst part of the book. And having a slur carved into her back, that was, I don't know, that was haunting to me. I hope that it can go away. I don't know, we'll find out in the next book, hopefully, um, or it can be transformed maybe. But yeah, that was really awful to read. <laughs> there were still moments of lightheartedness, not really lightheartedness, but like levity when Amari and Zane go to the town to try and find the Ogbon, Ogbon players. Agbo? I don't know how to say it. Ag Agbon players, sorry for butchering that. And getting them together was like a nice scene. And then after they rescue Zele, which yay, but also Inan's helpfulness, not helpfulness, he like lets them go, even though technically he's on their side, but kind of not on their side. I, it's very confusing at that point. I was no longer, I mean, I was never a fan of Inan. I didn't like Zele and Inan's relationship. I did find it to be in still but it didn't stop me from loving the book because it's literally like four chapters of them liking each other. So I just, I, it just doesn't affect my reading that much. But yeah, it made me not like him even more, I guess. Because he's just so wishy-washy. He doesn't know what he's doing, which I guess is fair. But not fair when you are in the middle of a war like this. And Amari is doing great. So <laughs> no excuses. <laughs> and so after they rescue Zele and they try and get that ship, those ship people, what are they called? The mercenaries? Sorry. They're mercenaries with a ship. And then it's the guy from the desert town. And he's like, I knew you'd come back. And Zelly's like, yeah, we can't pay you money, but you will have favor with the gods. And he's like, okay. That was baffling still to me the second time around. Um, it doesn't really seem like there's a real reason other than, I mean, clearly he likes Zelly. I'll tell you my predictions for Children of Virtue and Vengeance at the end of the book. But one of them is that I feel like probably Inanna is going to come back somehow. So I'm worried there's going to be a love triangle in Children of Virtue and Vengeance. But anyway, back to... The guy whose name I forgot, Rowan. That's probably going to be something romantic, I feel. And But that's not a reason to go send your whole crew out. So that was really weird, especially because the gods are not their gods. He's from a different place. Very interesting. But I like that there is an introduction to other countries and things. Like Orisha is not just the whole world. Like there's other stuff going on in the world. And hopefully we get to see that in Children of Virtue and Vengeance. So we see Rowan. They get to the island. They sneak past the guards and everything, which we de then find out that they didn't actually sneak past. They basically let them through because they had Zelia and Zane's father and they were using him as like, not bait because they didn't know he was there, but they were using him to get them to give up the artifacts. And they did give up the artifacts and they killed Baba anyway, which was so sad. Both of Zeli's parents are dead. I, I remember the first time I read it, I like couldn't believe what I just read. And also Mama Agba, we don't know what happened to her. We assume she died because there was no way for them to get Baba since he was with her. But we don't know. I'm hoping she also comes back in the next book. I hope she's not dead. So at least Zeli still has at least one parental figure. And then we're basically in like the final battle. Inan is like, I have to destroy magic because it caused me to kill someone and magic is gonna be the demise of all of us 
and it was definitely not my fault that I killed someone. It was the magic that made me do it. That's what I got from that. And he baits Zelle into using her powerful magic on the scroll. That happens. And then Inan is like, oh my God, I saved the world from magic because it's evil. And then he sees that his father is about to get stabbed or killed or something. Like without thinking he uses magic and his father sees it. And I guess his magic leaves like a physical element behind that I don't remember. But I thought that was interesting that doesn't really coincide with everything else we learned about magic. I didn't really realize, but it left like crystals behind and the king sees them and Inan sees them. And they're the same crystals that were left near Kai's corpse. And his father immediately is like, it was you. And he stabs his own son, which is brazy. That was another big thing. Baba dying and then the king killing his own son. I think killing, I don't know. We don't know if he's dead technically. And I do think he's coming back in the second book, but stabbing his own son. And then Amari comes and is the badass of the book, I guess. And she freaking fights her dad and wins and kills her own dad. This was a whole lot of bloodshed. Once again, I really don't think people realize that when they start this book, how dark it is. This whole family killed each other basically. And like the dad killed the son, the daughter killed the dad. But I don't know. I think this whole battle kind of shows that the royal family, like like the king didn't really love his children. Like in the beginning, we learn about the fights that Amari and Inan had when they were kids that their dad made them do where Amari got a ton of scars from her brother stabbing her in the back, literally. Their father made them do that because his first family was weak. He said they were weak and they got killed by the Magi, which is why he doesn't like the Magi. And he was like, you're not, that's not gonna happen to you. And I know that's super messed up, obviously, but in a sense, it does seem like it's to protect them, even if he's going about it in a terrible, abusive way. But at the end, he doesn't care about them at all. He's ready to kill them. This doesn't make any sense. I kind of feel like it does turn him into like a mustache trolling villain, but I don't know, he deserves it. <laughs> and then more and more things happen. Zelly does an incantation, a chant. I'm not really sure what to call it. The sunstone shatters. She's brought into like a dreamlike, state where she thinks she's dead and she thinks she sees the goddess Oya like the goddess of death and it's actually her mom and when I first read this the first time last or in 2018 um I thought that that meant her mom was the goddess of death like for real but upon the second reread I think it's just views her mom as so beautiful and everything that she kind of mistaken her for the goddess or like everyone is the goddess when they die but not that her mom has always been Oya before she died but they have this whole conversation. It's very loving and heart-wrenching. I think I cried the first time I read it. I teared up on the train while I was reading this. And then Zelle wakes up and she's like, did I do it? And all we know is that Amari now has a white streak in her hair and in the darkness, she has a, like a vibrant blue light swirling in her hand. So that's all we know. And then the book ends, that's the end of the epilogue. And then we have the author's note, which I talked about before. Um, yeah, so that is the conclusion of the book. Once again, I'm giving it five stars. I really love this book. Again, on reread, I really felt like very similar emotions to the first time I read it. I thought that it at least be, I mean, it was tampered down. Like I literally sobbed at the ending while I was on the plane listening to this the first time. So, and this time I just teared up. So yeah, but I still like felt things for the characters. I still loved the characters. I still enjoyed seeing the characters through all the pitfalls and stuff. I did notice more things that I wasn't a huge fan of, but I, then I noticed more things that I was a fan of. So I think it evens out and it still gets five stars from me. Like I said, I'll be starting Children of Virtue and Vengeance soon. And my predictions, like I said, I think maybe the ending of that meant, I don't know what it meant, honestly. Like what, if, like how did Amari get the streaks? We do see Zane in like the epilogue and he doesn't have a white streak. So it doesn't mean that everyone becomes a diviner or anything. Kind of what I think it might mean is that Inan's like body or like Inan's mind took over Amari's body or something because he also had the white streak, which is also never explained why he has only a streak and not his full head of hair. So I guess that's my working theory right now or they're sharing a body. I hope they're at least sharing the body because I would hate for Amari to be gone. Um, I liked her way better than Inan. So that is my current working theory. I literally just came up with this just now, so. We'll see what happens in the second book. Um, my other theory is hopefully we get to see a little bit more of the world. I don't know what else I'd expect to see, honestly. 
I don't even know what's going to happen now because the king is dead. So now what? I don't, I don't know. But yeah, I think that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Sorry, it was kind of a mess. Um, like I said, I'm doing the Children of Virtue and Vengeance vlog. It will be up hopefully next month. I can't make any promises. I don't want to make any promises. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. In the comments down below, let me know any thoughts you had while reading Children of Blood and Bone. Anything you want to say, anything you want to say about what I said about the book, please leave it in the comments down below. Since this video is spoilery already, I don't think you have to mark any spoilers you say in the comments. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. If you liked me doing this book diary, reading vlog kind of thing. Let me know any other books you think I should do it for. My Goodreads TBR is always around if you're interested. And I have my own books TBR also on there if you want to make suggestions for that. And what else? Hit the notification bell. Follow me on social media. I have Instagram and Goodreads and Twitter. Follow me on all those things. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.